A United Nations inquiry has found Israeli forces may have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity by targeting unarmed children, journalists and the disabled in Gaza. The report, released by the U.N. Human Rights Council Thursday, looked at Israel's bloody response to weekly Great March of Return demonstrations launched by Palestinians in Gaza nearly a year ago. Da -da 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 -da. If you listen to the radio, you may have heard it said that Israel is now facing allegations that they are guilty of crimes against humanity, that they're guilty of war crimes, that they're guilty of shooting and killing children with snipers when these children were engaged in peaceful protest at the Israeli border. These allegations come from a United Nations Human Rights Council. And right away, this narrative stirs up emotions, perhaps contradictory and conflicted emotions for some, perhaps just sympathy for the side that is getting shot dead. It's completely understandable. But sympathy, especially in politics, must always be used as an analytical tool. And if you want to really understand what's going on here, let's not be vague, let's look at the particulars, and let's try to sympathize also with the side that's been pulling the triggers. Because I can tell you, when I did the research on this, when I started looking into it, how could I or how could anyone else who's on the other side of that fence with orders to shoot people who are starting to cut through the fence, how could they have acted differently? Quote, Israeli security forces, I'm just going to say the Israeli military, the Israeli military shot a 16-year-old in the neck with live ammunition at the demonstration where this so-called peaceful protest was taking place on August 3rd, where he had crossed the barbed wire together with other youths. Now, let's just pause for a moment. The picture you see on screen, this is not the same young man, but this is a group of young men doing the same thing, part of the same protest. This is not necessarily the same day, not necessarily the same young men, all right? But this is indicative. Now, what you see happening here at this fence, the barbed wire, and so on, if this were any other border in the world, what would you expect the soldiers to do? What if these were, I don't know, Mexicans coming up to a barbed wire fence where American borders were guarding the fence with orders to shoot to kill someone if they try to cut through the fence or if they come through the barbed wire? What if it was the border between Iran and Turkey? What if it was the border between China and India? What if it was the border between India and Pakistan? Any border in the world guarded with a fence guarded by heavily armed men, if you had people coming up and trying to cut through the fence and so on, what do you expect these soldiers to do? Now, in this case especially, this is a context where there's smoke in the air. There are, in fact, explosive devices being used by the Palestinian side being sent over, explosive and incendiary devices. Um, there are also rocks being hurled. There are various things that add to the sense of... Uh, of ongoing conflict. But we continue. He was hurling stones at the Israeli military from a distance of approximately 20 meters from the separation fence. The Israeli military opened heavy fire on the group, striking the young man, who was then transferred to a hospital in Hebron, where he remained for two weeks. He returned to Gaza and was admitted to the intensive care unit, but was pronounced dead in September. The commission finds that this young man did not pose an imminent threat of death or serious injury to the Israeli soldiers when he was shot. So let's not be vague, people. This can be vaguely described as quote-unquote shooting a child who was quote-unquote not a threat at a quote-unquote peaceful protest. Take a look at this short film clip and you tell me if by any reasonable definition, let alone a United Nations definition, this could be described as a peaceful protest. A group of protesters splits off and digs in at the barbed wire. The IDF is caught off guard. They race up in jeeps. The protesters throw stones and firebombs. The IDF responds again with a barrage of gas, pushing many of the protesters back. Having an ideology is easy. Having sympathy is hard work. It's tough. It's exhausting. 
It's demoralizing. And that's exactly what I'm here to ask you to do. I'm here to ask you to have some detachment and some compassion, not just for the people who got shot, but also for the men who pulled the triggers. And why? Not for the purpose of building up your self-esteem, not to make yourself feel like you're better than those who happen to disagree with you, those who happen to be members of a rival political party. I'm asking you to do it for the sake of understanding what this situation is, the difference between fiction and nonfiction, and the sometimes pernicious role that not merely national governments play in this game, but the United Nations itself, that the United Nations has in many ways become no better than, and no different from, the lowest form of biased journalism. This is a separate account of a 16-year-old being shot dead by the Israeli army. And at 16 years old, this account can be indeed categorized as a child shot dead, as they're using 18 as the uh, legal definition of the beginning of adulthood. 5 p.m. on the 7th of September, the Israeli military shot this 16-year-old in the chest as he was approximately 300 meters from the fence walking toward it. He died from his injuries on the same day. According to an eyewitness, there was a heavy presence of the Israeli military on the Israeli side of the fence on the afternoon that he was shot. A group of protesters had been burning tires, throwing rocks, and launching incendiary kites near the fence, which started a fire in an Israeli military communication tower. Let me just pause for a moment here. I know it may sound like a joke, these incendiary kites. I looked into it. It is not a joke. These are deadly serious. They've done very serious damage to property. And in this case, it wasn't just a field full of corn that lit on fire. The Israeli military on the other side of the fence there had their tower light on fire. So... I don't know what definition of a peaceful demonstration or peaceful protest you're using. I do not see how any objective outside observer, whether from the United Nations or from the New York Times, I do not see how anyone could regard what's happening here as a peaceful protest. And I don't know how you could expect the military defending a border, in effect, defending a fence, defending a border garrison, defending their tower, I don't see how you would expect them to practice nonviolence when this is what they're facing from the other side. So Israeli military vehicles responded by firing live ammunition and tear gas toward the demonstrators. Photographs show heavy smoke, fire, and tear gas that afternoon. While the demonstrations were certainly chaotic and threatening, the commission does not find that this young man posed an imminent threat of death or serious injuries to Israeli military soldiers when he was shot. Now I ask you, in those conditions, if it were you, if you were on the Israeli military side, would you have pulled the trigger? Freedom of the press does not consist only of the freedom to tell the truth. It does include the freedom to misrepresent and to lie. And it's very, very easy to misrepresent the facts when they're in such an emotionally charged context. In this case, we're told 35 of those killed were children, three were clearly identifiable paramedics, and two were marked as journalists. This makes it sound as if the Israeli military were intentionally targeting paramedics. How is it possible that at a protest, just by accident or happenstance, they would happen to shoot so many paramedics. This claim becomes absurd when you simply look at the numbers. At this series of protests transpiring over several months, over 6,000 people were shot. Out of those 6,000, only a few were journalists and paramedics. And as you're about to see, the journalists and paramedics were very much bunched together with the protesters, surrounded by smoke and so on. And to some extent, 
They were participating in the protests, coming right up to the fence, and so on. On the contrary, these same numbers do indicate the extent to which the Israeli military were taking great pains, making great efforts, not to shoot children, journalists, and paramedics, because this is a tremendously small percentage of the more than 6,000 people who did indeed get shot. Does that sound surreal and cold and cruel for me to say that? This is politics. This is political analysis. We have to be sympathetic, cold, and cruel by turns. Let's rewind. Notice, two people point. They told us they saw where the bullet hit the ground, just a few feet from the medics. The bullet continued onward. This is the 21st century, and these events tend to be recorded from many different angles, on many different video cameras, on many different mobile phones, not to mention security cameras maintained by the military, what have you. And the New York Times, they took the story of a medic, of a nurse, who was shot in the center of her chest. And... They really put in the work to make a complex 3D model and a diagram and to figure out the precise trajectory of the bullet and how it was that she was shot in the center of her chest. I would like to suggest to you, as a speculation, that when they started doing that research, they probably imagined that they were going to prove that the Israeli military intentionally, with cruel disregard for human life, targeted and shot this woman in the middle of her chest, despite the fact that she was there as a medic, that she was there just to help injured protesters. But in fact, as you can see from this diagram on screen, what the New York Times figured out was that the border guards fired a warning shot that struck the ground, and then this warning shot ricocheted up and hit this woman as it happens right in the center of the chest. There's absolutely no way the border guard could have intentionally planned for this ricochet to hit her. On the contrary, they were trying to move the protesters back in a situation, again, that is so violent, it really cannot be described as a protest at all. Um, And I think uh, amongst the numbers of killings, what we also found, which was um, a great concern, was the fact that... uh, Protected groups who are protected categories in international law, protected persons such as children, people with disabilities, and also health workers and journalists were amongst those who were both killed and injured in large numbers. It's really easy to tell this tale in terms of contrasting ideological extremes. On the one hand, you have the extremes of the Muslim fundamentalists, and on the other hand, you have people like this shown on screen American Christian fundamentalists who will support Israel and support the Israeli military no matter how many crimes against humanity they may commit, so on and so forth. But there's another more subtle and pervasive form of idealism at work here in terms of what the United Nations has done in publishing this report and what the mainstream press has done in recycling and propounding it in a totally unquestioning manner. And the report, if you just even read what I have on screen for you here, the report has internal contradictions. It makes no sense for Barbara Bibbo, who's earning a good living, earning a salary from Al Jazeera, to to write this article. It makes no sense for it to simply quote wholesale to just word for word copy what the United Nations has told her the situation is, especially not when, look at the highlighted text there, highlighted in yellow, when you're reporting that these people were hurling stones using incendiary kites and balloons, so firebombs of various kinds, and were cutting through the fence at the border. And you're just reporting this as if there's no contradiction there, there's nothing further to reflect on, there's no contradiction within the source you're quoting from. You're reporting that this was a peaceful protest and that it was a crime against humanity for these people to be shot when cutting holes through the fence, etc. Now, if you go up to a prison and you're you're on the outside, you're having a quote-unquote peaceful protest in front of a prison, and then you start cutting through the fence, 
will you be shot? Is it or is it not the job of the prison guards to shoot you? If you are protesting at the border between any two countries, pick any example you like. Again, the border between uh, Iran and Turkey, to use two Muslim nations. So let's say, hey, the border between Turkey and, uh, and Cyprus. There's a contentious border where there sometimes are protests. If you're quote-unquote protesting at that border and there are firebombs, etc., and then people are cutting through the fence and you're just going to re report on this in this manner, you're just going to reproduce without questioning the contradictions within the United Nations report. Why does the United Nations even exist and why does so-called independent journalism exist? If this is what you get from sources as diverse as Al Jazeera and Democracy Now! I'll play the clip again. Democracy Now!, as we heard at the opening of this video. A United Nations inquiry has found Israeli forces may have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity by targeting unarmed children, journalists, and the disabled in Gaza. Let's not fall into the trap of complaining that a human being is merely all too human. When they went to the United Nations to get an opinion, they did not get an objective and unbiased opinion from a faceless institution. They got the opinion of Sarah Hossein. Sarah Hossein has her own Wikipedia article. If you think Sarah Hossein is an unbiased and detached observer of the Israeli-Palestine conflict, you must be dreaming. Sarah Hossein represents someone who has lived her entire life at an unbelievable level of privilege, beginning with her degree from Oxford University and proceeding to being in the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and now being one of the Lords of Poverty over at the United Nations. So don't judge based on appearances. Don't just judge based on her name or the fact that she is Bangladeshi. But the perspective of Sarah Hossein is going to be much, much different than if you employed someone either to conduct this research or to present the findings in a reasonable way to the press on behalf of the United Nations if you employed someone who maybe had combat experience, someone who had himself or herself served as a border guard who had been through those types of conflicts, maybe you'd get a, uh, a different perspective than you would from presenting someone who was the winner of the 2016 International Women of Courage Award, um, awarded by the United States Secretary of State. Um, Sarah Hussein does not represent the United Nations. And there's the further, deeper question of who or what the United Nations itself is supposed to represent. These questions were already raised decades ago in a book that was popular at the time but has now been forgotten, 1994, Lords of Poverty. The more fundamental questions we have to ask here in terms of what are the vectors for political change, I don't think they can be productively directed towards the Palestinians. You're not really going to be able to appeal to Hamas to having a more enlightened perspective on this. And they can't be directed towards the teenagers doing military service, pulling the triggers, standing on the other side of that fence. It is not reasonable to demand that in the name of human rights, they stand idly by and let people cut through the barbed wire and cut through the fence and come through. That would only lead to them shooting them once they're through the other side of the fence. It's absurd. But what we can do productively, I think, here and now, a difference we can make in just the next couple of years is start to criticize and question the United Nations, the role played by the United Nations here, and then the role played by the mainstream press, people who are earning a lot more money than I do. Click on the link below this video. You can find out exactly how many dollars and cents I make out of doing political analysis on YouTube, by the way. People who are making more money than I do and who are taking propaganda generated by particular people with particular political biases of the United Nations, and they're just repackaging it and presenting it to the public as so-called independent journalism. Da -da 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 -da.